So here we are, Judd Brewer, and we are at the Garrison Institute in New York State, where there is an ongoing conference on um, meditation and the scientific explanation of what happens when you meditate and what effects it has. And Judd, I think you have interesting stuff to explain how we can have another experience of ourselves through meditation and that how that can support sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Judson Brewer. I'm an assistant professor at Yale University School of Medicine in the psychiatry department. And I'm studying, primarily studying um, mindfulness training as treatment for addictions and also studying the neurobiologic mechanisms of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we're looking at that we're very interested in is how uh, we get addicted to things. And uh, the secret is that we're all addicted to one degree or another. It's just that some of these addictions are more socially acceptable. Um, so we can treat people and help them quit smoking, for example. Um, but really, the underlying process may be common to all of us, and that's something that we're very interested in looking at. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing some neuroimaging work to really figure out what the brain regions are that are involved in, um, in this process of meditation, and have found that uh, there's a specific network of brain regions called the default mode network, which gets deactivated, gets dampened when people are meditating. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very nice to find because this default mode network is involved in self-referential processing. So when mm -hmm. we're thinking about ourselves, when we're mind wandering, when we're worrying about things, um, when we're getting a craving for a cigarette, then we might start to activate those self-referential brain regions. And during different types of meditation, we found that three different types of meditation will specifically dampen this this brain region, so, which and is pretty nice to see. Of course, there, there are parallels to the need for having uh, access to oil and cars and transportation <laughs> as well. Is that the, uh, just the similar process or, or is there any difference or is it just the same? My humble opinion would be there's probably not much of a difference because okay. we, you know, for example, if we want to um, buy a, a big car that uses, uh, that's not very fuel efficient, mm. uh, we might think, oh, I want that car because I want to impress the ladies mm. or I want to, mm. um, I want to do whatever. And, mm. and so we start thinking, oh, I need to have that car and we get this craving, we go out and buy the car. Yep. Um, so in that sense, it's not really any different than a cigarette, it's just a little more expensive. Mm. I guess in the short term, <laughs> maybe not in the long term. You uh, were about to say three different ways. Yeah, so we studied uh, practitioners in the insight meditation tradition mm -hmm. and had them do standard meditations. Uh, one's called loving kindness, uh, one's called awareness of your breath, and one's called choiceless awareness where you just, um, you're just aware but you're not uh, fixated on any particular object. Mm -hmm. And we found that during each of these three meditations, uh, people were down-regulating, we're, we're decreasing activity in the default mode network. And more interesting than that, so that was, that was pretty nice to find. It seems to fit with the theory uh, in a lot of contemplative practices, whether they're Christian, Muslim, um, you know, Hindu, Buddhist, they all get at this core concept of self. And the idea is that we've been duped. We've been, we think, you know, things that we think are, are cause happiness are actually mm. causing, uh, they're giving us a little bit of pleasure, little hits of pleasure here and there, but that actually reinforces the process and keeps us addicted to doing those things more. Mm. And the idea with these different practices is that we can see how painful that actually is. And once we see that, we can learn to start to let go. And there's a joy in that letting go. And the joy of letting go is actually more sweet than getting that chocolate or that cigarette or that whatever. Mm. It's a uh, freedom. Yeah, freedom uh, feels pretty good, short, I imagine. Shortcut to um, happiness. Well, I don't know how short, <laughs> short of a cut it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For some, but it can be a long journey. Once, once you're there, it's like a shortcut. You, know, you don't need so much outer um, support. Yeah, it's like this joie de vivre. There's, yeah. a, there's an inherent happiness that, that we all have. Thich yeah. Nhat Hanh says happiness is available, help yourself. Yeah. We just forget that it is there and we cloud it over and we try to make ourselves happy through other means and are actually making ourselves suffer rather than doing that. It's yeah, we, pr we project our capacity to get happy on outer objects yes, we and, do. and uh, routines. 
and the thing is we don't have much control over those outer things and so sometimes we can get chocolate but we can't get it all the time and sometimes when we eat chocolate we're not even happy when we eat chocolate and so we think oh well maybe i need to eat more or maybe i need to do this or maybe Mm -hmm. i need to do that so we're constantly running around chasing our tails Mm -hmm. trying to get happy when in reality it's it's all here Mm -hmm. Uh, we just have to look for it yeah and then maybe also when that comes about uh, how we relate can be brought to a deeper level and we can uh, maybe even get more happy than ever we were ever possible yes able to uh, with all that stuff around us yeah absolutely so the buddha at least in buddhism the buddha described i think seven levels of happiness Uh the first level is the sense pleasures you know chocolate sex whatever The third level is the joy of concentration. And that's just the third level. When Mm -hmm. you're really concentrated in meditation, it feels great. And Mm -hmm. some of these absorptive meditative states are described as rapture, bliss. And Mm -hmm. they're not, you know, they're not described as, this is awful, this is terrible. They're described as rapture and bliss for a reason. Uh Much better than chocolate. That was the third. So there are... I imagine if, more. if I've got it right, and I, you know, I can speak to the third level, but yeah. that's pretty good in okay. itself. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, anything else that we should talk about? Did you? Um, I'm, I'm guessing you I'm can edit this that. part. No. Yeah, um, Did you want to talk about the neurofeedback at all? We can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. But we don't what, have what, to. What would that be? Well, I can I can kind of pick up with the uh, neuroimaging stuff and just talk about that a tiny bit if you want. Yeah. So, um, so one thing we found with the neuroimaging uh, was that we found some re- brain regions that were slightly different than it, that had been reported before, and so we wanted to go and confirm our findings. Mm-hmm. And there was a group at Yale um, headed by Zenius Papademetris who had developed this technique called uh, real-time. Uh, fMRI feedback where we can actually give people feedback from their own brain regions basically in real time. And so we could use this as a way to uh, bridge the gap between their first person subjective experience and what their brains were actually doing so we could make sure that these brain regions were actually lining up with their experience. And we did this and it worked pretty well where people were finding that this self-referential brain region was actually getting active when they were thinking about themselves and it was getting deactivated when they were concentrated. Um, But the other thing we were finding was that they were using this as feedback. And they were learning, oh, this is what it feels like to really feel my breath as compared to think about my breath. And it's a night and day difference in their brain. And they were noticing, wow, that's a big difference. And so novices were learning to make their brains look like experienced meditators' brains in nine minutes, mm-hmm. really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. And so this, you know, we've, we stumbled upon this, and we might be able to start to use this type of feedback to show people um, whether they're actually activating or deactivating self-referential so it's brain regions. biofeedback. Yeah, a very okay. expensive biofeedback. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, there are pretty simple uh, stuff you can buy that uh, you clip onto your ear, I think, and your finger. Yes. That will give you a similar, similar kind of, of uh, feedback. I'm not sure that the feedback is the same specific feedback no. that you get when no. you look at a brain region. Um, but certainly biofeedback's been around a long time. I'm guessing if those were as good as this, they mm. would have really taken off. Mm. Um, but those technologies have been around for a while, and I, I haven't seen them really go very far. So my guess is that you have to combine this type of biofeedback with something a little more specific, for example, a you know self-referential brain region. I think at least that's where we think would be a good place to start. I could be way off. One thing that interests me is this self-referencing uh, area. Uh-huh. Uh, what is that? Is it possible to say anything about it? Well, some describe it as this uh, this part of the brain region that's involved in the narrative self, so the self across time. So when I think about the past, when I think about the future, when I think about me over time, this brain region seems to be critical for that as part of a network. Mm-hmm. I like to talk in, in terms of fear and love. Mm-hmm. Uh, does it connect to what you're uh, in, in working with? Depends on what you mean by fear and love. So, if you're talking about romantic love, where no, I want to be I loved, talk on a, about altruistic, it on a very, very uh, big level, mm-hmm. that fear is uh, what we feel when we lose something we have, mm-hmm. or we think we won't get what we want, mm-hmm. and love is our longing 
back to that unity that we were once born into this world from. Okay. And when we're separated from existence, we don't trust that the, the world will provide everything we need on, for instance, the Maslow need of hierarchy of needs. So then we uh, become fearful but when we don't trust existence or, or our fellow beings. Right, right. So in, in that respect, does it connect to this center? It, I would guess that it might, and we would have to test that specifically. Uh -huh. But mm -hmm. when there is fear, there's this kind of clenching yeah. where we're kind of trying to hold on to contraction. things. And that contraction may be a, a, a very basic sense of self. Mm. Oh, mm. you know, I'm not going to get this. Mm. Me, me, me. Mm. And so that contraction can be something that we can actually monitor uh, in, you know, within mm. people's brain regions, and specifically with this posterior cingulate brain region. So the two might line up, but we would have to test that explicitly. Mm. And my thinking is that um, whenever we are able to get uh, out, of our, out of the way of our selves, mm -hmm. uh, there is only love and the longing and the, the, the trust in that is something like our inner essence. Yeah, it's like the world is delicious <laughs> when we're out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really delicious. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think that, that um, takes care of it. And, and I, I will uh, make three different parts on, on uh, YouTube, probably. Okay. And, and I use this for, for all, all these uh, fireflies you have. <laughs>